This is the city of Glasgow, a city that was once known as the global hub for shipbuilding where 20% of all ships in the world were built, more than any other city on earth. And it was the second most economically important city for the British Empire only behind London. During both World War I and World War II, as the British battled the Germans, Glasgow provided most of the battleships and submarines used by the Royal Navy. So much so that some people say if they didn't build and repair ships fast enough, the Allies may have lost the war. But fast forward to today, Glasgow shipbuilding industry and consequently UK shipbuilding industry is nowhere to be seen. Most of its companies went bust, and most of its shipyards became derelict alongside residential areas that lay abandoned. So, what happened? How did Glasgow and the UK shipbuilding industry rise and become so dominant? How did the city make global trade possible? How did a global shockwave manage to kill the entire industry and consequently, the entire city? And lastly, how does this contribute to the growing social and health problems in the community? including the Glasgow effect where sadly, most of its citizens die prematurely. So to begin the story, we need to go back to the 1700s. During this time, the city of Glasgow was a tobacco giant that controlled most of the world's tobacco trade. This happened mainly for two reasons. Its strategic location on the west of Scotland that directly faces America, and some clever policy making by the city that granted lucrative contracts. For example, in 1747, the French monarchy granted Glasgow merchants a monopoly for the import of tobacco into France and its colonies, and it managed to get a monopoly on the European tobacco trade. By the 1750s, Glasgow handled more tobacco trades than the rest of Britain's ports combined. This made Glasgow merchants very rich that they essentially became oligarchs. These tobacco lords dominated the industry, they applied ruthless tactics and manipulated prices in order to stamp out competition. Even the first president of the US, George Washington, saw his debt swell up to 2,000 pounds by the late 1760s for maintaining his Mount Vernon plantation. 2,000 pounds back then is around 300,000 pounds today adjusted for inflation. Thomas Jefferson, on the verge of losing his own farm, rightly accused British merchants of unfairly depressing tobacco prices and forcing American farmers to take on unsustainable debt loads. This all changed during the two decades between the American Revolutionary War in 1775 and the Napoleonic Wars in 1793. As Glasgow tobacco lords lost most of their farms in America, in addition to losing two of its best customers in America and France. So Glasgow merchants eventually lost their interest in tobacco and found other profitable industries. First, it was linen and eventually shipbuilding. You see, in 1768, when Glasgow merchants were still tobacco kings, they discovered a huge problem. The River Clyde, which is the river that connected Glasgow to the British seas, was too shallow for the largest of ships to navigate. As a result, Cargo arriving from other countries like America or France had to be transferred to smaller ships in nearby ports like the Greenock before entering the River Clyde. So the only solution was to deepen the river by dredging it, although that's easier said than done. They tried various solutions but long story short, it all failed and the project was abandoned for quite some time. It was only in the 1850s, almost 100 years later by the way, that engineers began to undertake the project more seriously and the British Empire invested heavily into deepening the river. And they eventually completed the project, allowing for the expansion of the shipbuilding industry. But even before the dredging project was completed, Glasgow already had a growing shipbuilding industry. Glasgow was the first place where the first fully iron boat was made the Falcon, which can be considered as the grandmother of all of the modern ships that define global trade today. This was because Glasgow has a big linen industry, so they have expertise in metalwork and also steam engines. Also, the men who radically improved the power, efficiency, and cost-effectiveness of steam engines and sparked the Industrial Revolution James Watt was born in the nearby city Greenock and studied at the University of Glasgow. So it's no wonder that Glasgow shipbuilders were the first one who learned and benefited from his invention. Both the increasing use of iron instead of wood, 
and the adoption of steam propulsion were some of the major technological advancement that really built Glasgow's shipbuilding industry. The completion of the dredging operation was well-timed, as the channel finally became navigable all the way even with the largest of ships at the same time as the shipbuilding industry was booming. Shipbuilding replaced trade as the major activity on the river, and shipbuilding companies started rapidly establishing themselves there. To date, it is estimated that over 300 companies have engaged in shipbuilding on the River Clyde, although probably at most 30 to 40 companies were operating at any given time. Some of the most influential companies include John Brown of Clyde Bank, Danny of Dumberton, Scott of Greenock, Simon and Lopnes of Renfrew, and the crown jewel Fairfield of Govan, that produced many of the ships used by the British Royal Navy, a notoriously picky customer. This company alone employed around 70,000 workers across 19 yards and had the largest crane in the world at the time which has a maximum lift capacity of 250 tons. By the start of the 20th century, Glasgow and consequently the UK has dominated the shipbuilding industry. The River Clyde by itself was producing half of all ships built in the UK. Of course, there were other major shipbuilding cities like Belfast whose most famous work include the RMS Titanic, and you know how that story goes. But in terms of dominance, no city on earth could compete with Glasgow. It built more ships than any other city, over 30,000 ships or 20% of the world's ships, and most of the population was either employed directly in shipbuilding or in a major supplier for the shipbuilding industry like the iron, the boiler, the pumps, etc. The shipbuilding industry built the city of Glasgow, and Glasgow built the UK shipbuilding industry and global trade. Now, why did Glasgow's shipbuilding industry become so successful? After all, Britain wasn't lacking of suitable ports and strategic locations to build the shipbuilding industry. And there were other major shipbuilding countries as well like Germany, but they could never catch up to the UK. Well, there are three reasons that could help explain why. The first and most obvious one was that it has a pool of skilled labor relevant to the shipbuilding industry. It was a major industrial city with experience in iron founding and engineering. James Watt studied at the University of Glasgow and put his newly developed steam engines to use there, and some of the best marine engineers of the era like Robert Napier and John Elder of Fairfield Shipbuilding was based in Glasgow. This meant that for entrepreneurs who wanted to start a shipbuilding company, Glasgow was the best choice since they know that the town was filled with skilled labor relevant to the industry. The second reason is something that economists call technology spillovers. You see, the River Clyde is a big river, and all along that river was competing shipyards working to build the best possible ship. And the way the shipbuilding industry functioned was that, when a project was completed and there wasn't any more work, then the workers would all move and go to work in another shipyard that has yet to begin a project. So a worker can work with at least three different companies in a single year. This employment model makes it impossible to hide technologies or innovations away from other companies. It's quite annoying if you're a shipyard owner trying to protect your secret know-how on how to make a good ship, but it's great for the industry as a whole because knowledge and innovation will spread extremely fast therefore benefiting everyone rather than just one company. The third reason was a strong supply chain. Glasgow was a city built around shipbuilding and it had accompanying industries that were all built around the shipbuilding industry. For example, heavy industries like iron foundries, trains, ports, the crane making companies all supplied the shipbuilding industry with its much needed iron equipment and transportation. And this includes softer industries like woodwork, carpentry, carpet, and even things like retail stores that provided shipyard workers with daily necessities, or pubs and cinemas that the shipyard workers went to after work. All of these industries helped to foster a strong supply chain that was all built around the shipbuilding industry. World War I saw the peak of Glasgow's shipbuilding industry. As the Royal Navy battled the Germans in famous submarines, Glasgow was tasked to build and repair as many ships as possible to help the British war effort. Some of these ships include HMS Renowned Battle Cruisers, HMS Valiant Battleships, HMS Combat Destroyers, HMS L-15 Submarines, and many more. By the way, RMS Lusitania, whose sinking by a German U-boat killed 1,198 passengers in 1915, 
and later became the major reason why the U.S. entered the war was built by John Brown of Clydebank, one of the major shipyards operating in Glasgow. The interwar period between the end of World War I and the start of World War II saw some crises for Glasgow's shipbuilding industry. The sharp reduction of demand as the war was over meant that the shipbuilding capacity of the country was massively inflated by about one-third. During this time, many ships were closed and employees were laid off. Along with many ships that were built during wartime eventually sold for scrap. In 1913, the shipbuilding output of Glasgow was at 760,000 tons. Ten years later, in 1923, it was only at 180,000 tons a 75% reduction in output. In 1928, the industry nearly recovered as output rises to 600,000 tons, but a year later, the Great Depression happened and millions of people were laid off all across Britain and the entire world. In 1932, the unemployment rate in Scotland was around 30%, and the shipbuilding capacity of Glasgow was down to 56,000 tons in 1933, a 90% reduction. But this wasn't when all hell breaks loose and the industry collapsed. Adolf Hitler took power in 1932, and the concerns of an impending war meant that Glasgow shipbuilders were back running and building battleships for the Royal Navy. Glasgow got an early taste of disaster when the passenger liner Athenia, a ship from Glasgow on its way to Canada, became the first shipping casualty of World War II. It was sunk by a German submarine in 1939. Two years later, in 1941, as Nazi Germany occupied France and began a series of bombing campaigns targeting the British, Glasgow became a prime target for the Luftwaffe as it was a major industrial center that contributed heavily to the British war effort, especially its shipyards. This was a hefty blow for many shipyards to recover from, but even then, Glasgow shipbuilders kept busy as the Allied forces managed to drive back the German army and eventually won the war. The end of World War II was when things got really concerning for Glasgow. As the war was over, Glasgow saw a sharp reduction in demand for battleships, the same problem they faced at the end of World War I. But this time, they never recovered because there were lots of other problems as well. Another major problem that the shipbuilding industry had on the demand side was the change in the way people were transported as air travel became more and more common. The 1950s saw ocean liners going out of fashion, and that's when jetliners like the Boeing 707 were mass-produced. So the demand for battleships and passenger ships both plummeted drastically in the 1950s. Both were Glasgow's specialty. Instead of passenger ships, the 1950s saw a rise of ships carrying cargo or tanker-based raw material products like oil and liquefied natural gas to be able to carry those goods in bulk. A trend that still continues to this day. Unfortunately, Glasgow failed to anticipate the changing trends of the industry and failed to pivot, becoming the victim of innovation. Ironic, because the ability to pivot from tobacco to linen and eventually shipbuilding in the 1800s was precisely the reason why Glasgow managed to become a shipbuilding giant in the first place. And then, there's the supply side problem. In the 1950s, there was another country rising to challenge the UK shipbuilding might, and that country was Japan. And the thing is, it was an unfair game. Shipbuilding in Japan was, and still is to some extent, one of the most protected and subsidized industries in the world. By the 1960s, it was clear that the Japanese government was helping shipbuilding companies with cheap labor, cheap land, lots of investments, loans with low or even zero interest rates, not to mention massive tax breaks. Thanks to all of these, the Japanese shipbuilding companies managed to grow rapidly and stave off competition. And they built larger and larger shipyards while investing in new technologies that were far more productive. This unfair competition put a strain on UK shipbuilding since it was mostly based on private enterprise. A UK government official that visits Japan in the 1960s once says that one of the Japanese shipyards had 22 times the level of productivity in terms of tonnage of ship per man per year, compared to what the British yards had. Of course, it's not like the UK didn't try to help Glasgow. Realizing the importance of the shipbuilding industry, the UK tried to help Glasgow but they did it in a weird way. Basically what they do was look at Japan. They got a massive shipyard and thanks to that, they got economies of scale. 
So the UK grouped together several shipyards into one, and they got economies of scale. But of course, anyone can tell that there's a massive difference between one giant shipyard and five shipyards miles apart from one another that are somehow grouped together. This group company was called Upper Clyde Shipbuilders, and as you can guess, it went bust just five years after it was created. Needless to say, that didn't help at all. Another deeper reason of why the Glasgow shipbuilding industry failed was because of its low rate of investment. You see, at the end of World War II, investors and shipyard executives already knew what will happen to the shipbuilding industry. There will be a sharp reduction in demand for battleships as the war ended. They learned this from their experience in World War I, when the industry entered a crisis after the war ended. So, why invest if you already knew that the industry would face a crisis anyway? Because of this, companies reinvested less than 5% of their profits into their shipyards and they kept using old and redundant machinery. No wonder that they could not compete with Japan that heavily invested in their shipbuilding industry. Ironically, the expectation of a declining shipbuilding industry turned into reality and became one of the reasons why the industry failed. The 1960s were a concerning time for Glasgow and the 1970s were a complete disaster. As demand had completely evaporated and competition was relentless, yards after yard were closing, and people were getting laid off left and right. Some Glasgow shipyards managed to survive for at least 5 years by taking on loss-making contracts and living off government loans, but the government has had enough. In 1971, Upper Clyde Shipbuilders, the group company that I talked about earlier, went into receivership. Apparently, out of the five yards, only one had remained profitable, but that yard had left the joint venture one year earlier. Then, the British government, led by Prime Minister Edward Heath, refused to further support a dying industry, which led to a crisis of confidence among its creditors and resulted in severe cash flow problems for the company. After the government refused to inject a loan of £6 million as a lender of last resort, the company collapsed. But then, a famous incident happened. Instead of going on a strike, which was the norm for workers after they got laid off, unions representing the shipyard workers decided to conduct a work-in, to continue working and complete orders already in place. This is to ensure that they projected the best image of the yard workers, and there will be no hooliganism, no vandalism, and no drinking. The tactic worked, and public sympathy from the citizens was high. At one point, a protest march was attended by 80,000 protesters, and they got a £5,000 donation from John Lennon. Eventually, the British government gave in and restructured the yards around two new companies. Govan Shipbuilders, formerly Fairfield, which if you remember was the crown jewel of Glasgow Shipbuilding, and Yarrow Shipbuilders, the profitable yard that had left the joint venture in 1970. To this day, out of countless yards sprawling across the River Clyde, only these two survive. The death of the shipbuilding industry also led to the death of a variety of industries in Glasgow. The iron foundries, the carpet making industry, the textile industry, the crane making companies, few of them survive as they had always depended on the shipyards for the bulk of their orders, and they also succumbed to cheaper imports from better equipped competitors like Japan, South Korea, and eventually China. Skilled workers who could find jobs elsewhere left Glasgow as there was no more employment opportunity there, and the young people soon followed leaving behind many problems in the city that can still be seen today. The only ones who didn't leave Glasgow were those who couldn't afford to leave. In 1961, Glasgow had a population of 1.14 million, whereas today it has a population of 630,000. During the last 50 years, the city had lost almost half of its population, more than any other city in the UK. And despite having an increasing population today, the share of the national population in Glasgow still continues to decrease. Now, this phenomenon of deindustrialization and urban shrinkage is nothing new, and has in fact happened in many cities throughout the developed countries. And the patterns of urban shrinkage are similar to what we see in Glasgow. First, the fall in investment led to deindustrialization, reducing the number of jobs and creating unemployment. Second, the population decline happens with the most qualified and educated people and the youngest leaving first. As a result, the poorest, the oldest, and those with little to no education or qualification 
are left behind in a falling city characterized by poverty, unemployment, and deteriorating standards of living. Cities left with these conditions are in a tough spot since the people who are still there are mostly unskilled laborers working in low-paid service jobs, and the falling rate of investment meant that they had few resources to work with. Perhaps the most famous example alongside Glasgow for this phenomenon is the city of Detroit, with the fall of its automobile industry. Now, all of these socio-economic problems naturally put a strain on the people's health conditions, which has created a problem called the Glasgow Effect, where people in Glasgow die younger and have poorer health conditions compared to other cities in Britain. Glasgow had the lowest life expectancy in Britain at 78.3 years for females and 73.1 years for males, far behind the average life expectancy across Britain at 81.6 years. Moreover, if you're living in Glasgow, you have a 30% higher chance of dying before the age of 65, with one out of four men in Glasgow will die before his 65th birthday even compared to other UK cities that experienced the industrialization and urban shrinkage like Manchester, Liverpool, and Birmingham, Glasgow's health problems are much more extreme, and to this day, people continue to debate why this phenomenon happens. Some refers to its disastrous housing policy and lack of social mobility. Some say it's the high level of toxins due to huge amounts of derelict wasteland. Others say it's vitamin D deficiencies, cold winter, social alienation, and there are many more hypotheses. But what we know for sure is that these problems started to emerge due to the fall of the shipbuilding industry and subsequently led to its deindustrialization. Glasgow is a cautionary tale about a city that depends fully on a single thriving industry, and how the changing trends of the world plus its inability to adapt and change collapse its shipbuilding industry. It's both fascinating and sad to see how a city that was so dominant because of its ability to pivot and adapt to change fell prey to the very same changes 100 years later, and how the death of the shipbuilding industry brought all of the city's industries plus the well-being of its citizens down with it. This is Doverhill, and see you next time.